It was in the time they called the Great Depression. It was July of 1930. We were living out in Holly Court. That's the little sawmill community, a ways east out of Coleman Hill, down on Hobson Creek in the Natchez River Bottom. Now, mind you, our home was in northern Louisiana in the little farming community of Alabama. Oh, that's where Oliver and I were born and grew up. And on January 31st, 1900, we got married in that precious Alabama church. The church was really the center of the whole community. And on weekdays, you could find it filled with the children because that's where school took place. But on Sundays, our whole family was right there. We had grandparents, parents, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, of course, us and our children. Some of us were inside, sitting on the hard wooden pews, tapping our toe and singing the familiar hymns, <coughs> listening to the word we preached. Some of us were resting in peace right outside the door under the shade trees at that churchyard cemetery. Now, how we got from the wonderful farming community of, of Alabama and northern Louisiana to a destitute sawmill camp in the Natchez River Bottom. That's another story for another day. This is the story about surprises. The day started with a buzz. It was really two flies and one thirsty mosquito circling that cord that hung down from the ceiling with one bare white bulb hanging on it. I yanked the covers up over my head, trying to avoid that insect duet. Didn't help. The flies were buzzing around singing their bass song. And the, the mosquito was buzzing around singing its tenor song. Besides that, it wasn't very comfortable under the covers because they were wet. Wet with the sweat that had rivered itself over my body all night long in July 1930 in the Natchez River bottom. Whew, I need to get out of there. Besides that, I could hear Oliver out in the barn hooking the mules up to the wagon. That reminded me, it's Saturday and Oliver's going to town. I need to get in there and get his breakfast organized. So I zipped in the kitchen and, oh, we were having uh, biscuits and gravy and a sausage and eggs and coffee. And, and I had to get that all stirred up. Directly, I could hear him coming across the yard, stomping that mud off of his boots. It had rained all night. He stepped up on the, the cypress log, uh, stump-like thing that served for a porch. Well, we didn't really have porches, but it was a stoop. He cleaned his boots really good and came on in the kitchen. I set his boot down. He thanked me. He bowed his head to thank the Lord. I thought, well, what's he going to be grateful for? Here we are in the middle of the Depression. How can he be thinking about being grateful? But I just played it. He thanked the Lord for his family. He thanked the Lord for the good health. He thanked the Lord for the friends in that Holly Fork community. He thanked the Lord for those strong mules that were going to get him to town and back with the supplies he needed. And he thanked the Lord for that food I had prepared for him and said, Amen. Well, I didn't say anything out loud because I'm kind of embarrassed about my bad attitude. But I thank the Lord for my good husband. He took care of me even when times were hard. And he took care of our family. So he was eating his breakfast. And we were, I was gathering up some extra biscuits and, and sausage and a little mason jar of water from the spring to put in a... a Syrup bucket, so he could have something to snack on on his way home. But we were talking about what all was on his supplies list, and he said, "Well, of course he had to get um, flour, and, and he had to get he liked to get some sugar, and um, he needed some tobacco for the men, and um, he he needed some chicken feed." I said, oh, if you're going to get chicken feed, look right 
right here is these, these chicken feed sacks that I've been saving to make a dress for Mary Lucy. I need one more that matches this, this pretty little blue pattern. She likes that for her new dress. She's got to have something new. And besides that, I'll, I need some I need some shoe leather and some tacks because Robert is going barefooted this summer, and that's okay. But when school starts, I want that boy to wear boots to school, and I'm going to have to resell the ones that Bill has outgrown. Well, he said he'd see if he could get some blue uh, chicken feed bags, and he'd see if he could get some leather. And, and then he said, now, Miss Agnes, I'm going to have to have some help from you today. That was an unusual for him to say that. I said, well, what do you need, Oliver? He said, well, I need you to go get your mother's crepe pitcher. Well, mother had given me her special cream pitcher, and it was about the only nice thing we had. And we, I didn't really want to put cream in it, so I used it to, uh, to keep the coins that I earned if I sold some butter or some eggs, or maybe I did some sewing for one of those ladies in Cone Hill. And every now and then I would earn a few coins and I would save them for mother's <coughs> picture because that made me feel good. So I got my picture. And I gave it over to him, and he poured out the two quarters that were inside the picture. He said, now, Miss Agnes, I didn't want to tell you this, but these two quarters are all the cash money to, we have to our name, and this is all I have to go buy supplies for us and for all the workers that work for us on this farm, on this sawmill. And I said, well, two quarters aren't going to buy all those supplies we just talked about. He said, well, I know they're not, but it's all we have. And I'm just going to take it, and I'm going to trust the Lord. Well, I knew better than to answer that. So he took the two quarters, and I put the picture away. He went out and, and climbed up on his wagon, and I stood there on the the cypress front porch or stoop and uh, he looked me straight in the eye and he said, Miss Agnes, you've got lots of work to do today. You stay busy and you don't worry. The Lord and I are going to town to get the supplies and I'll be back before you know it. Okay. So I ran in the house and put on my day dress and, and I knew that sun was creeping up in the sky and you don't want to be working outside picking peas in the garden when the sun's creeping up in the sky. So I was hurrying into the garden, picking the peas and the squash and the things we needed for Sunday lunch. Well, my peas were over here, and my corn was in here, and Oliver's watermelon was over here. Well, I heard this little snickering, little boy snickering. And I thought, that's those kind of boys over there. They're checking out those watermelons. And I was exactly right. But they didn't see me. So I just kind of hunkered down over there to see what they were going to do. But I knew what they were going to do. They walked up and down and they thumped a melon and thumped another one and thumped another one. And pretty soon they had checked every melon in the patch. And they giggling. They were trying to be quiet. They finally agreed on the one they wanted. They looked around and didn't see a soul. I just stayed hunkered down. Pop. They pulled that watermelon off that vine and took off. Look at his flip for the creek. And by the time they were, by the, the that bush by the creek, they were laughing out loud and hooting and hollering and having a great time. Well, I thought that was pretty good. We had a watermelon spare. We didn't have much, but we had a watermelon spare. So I went on about my business. And a little while, I was sitting under a white oak tree with my bucket shelling my peas. And I heard the Cotter Boys coming back. Now, that was Lloyd and Leo. They had a bunch of brothers. 
their youngest brother was named Glenn. Well, actually, their youngest brother was named Carol, and he had a little boy named Glenn, just last week or so. I heard him coming back. You could smell him before you could see him. <laughs> now, they had, made, they had made a pretty good effort to kind of wash up in the creek, but there were just streaks of, of watermelon juice on their arms, and one of them had a seed behind his ear. And, oh, and, but they, they were real smart. They got their fishing poles, and, and they were whistling and coming along like, like they'd been fishing. And they had to pass by our place to get to their house. And so Lloyd looked up and said, well, and he, of course, he saw me sitting there, showing my peeps. He said, well, howdy, Miss, Ho Miss, uh, Miss Sutton, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing good, boys. Um, are the fish biting? Oh, no, ma'am, we didn't catch a thing. Well, that's too bad. Maybe they'll bite this afternoon. So they went on. I was showing my peeps. It didn't take them long to get to their house, and it didn't take any time after they got to their house for the fireworks to start. The caterwauling, the wailing, the whacking, the crying, the ouch, stop please. Their mama was not impressed with their prank that they had done, and she took it out on behind the woodshed. So, I said, well, I'm sorry about that because they really didn't do any harm. But then I looked up and here they came. Barefooted, shuffling through the, the sand in the road and kicking the sand and their chins all dropped down and shoulders kind of shaking. They finally got over where I was and Miss Sutton, we, we came to see Mr. T.O. Mr. T.O., is he at home? Well, no, boys. He's gone to town. He's, he's gone to get supplies. He'll be back in a little while. We, we, we really need to see him. We need to see him bad. Well, you just watch for him to turn that corner with his mule and his wagon, and, and you come on back when you, when you see him get home. Oh, yes, yes, ma'am. Well, you could tell there wasn't going to be either one of them going to be sitting down any time that day. And they, they took off for home. <coughs> well, directly, here came the mules and the wagon and Oliver. Biggest mess you ever saw in your life. Mud all over the wagon. Mud all over the mules. Mud all over Oliver. But the wagon was full of supplies. I said, what in the world happened to you? He said, we'll talk about that later. And by the way, I have a surprise for you. Well, I'm excited about that. I figured maybe he had gotten the chicken feed in the right, right um, bag with the right fabric on it. So he pulled on over to the little commissary, the little store that we manage for the, for the workers that work for us there at the mill. And the men came out from wherever they had been, being on Saturday, and they helped him unload all the things into the store. And, and when everything was unloaded and they started to leave, he said, now wait up, men. I have something for you. And he had a kind of a brown paper bag, and inside he had little packets. It was seeds, seed, garden seeds. He started handing the seeds out to the different, different men. One of them looked at the seeds and looked at all of them and said, well, what are we supposed to do with this? We, we're, we work in the logging woods. We're not farmers. And he looked them straight in the eyes. Only Oliver could look. And he said, you may not want to be farmers, but if you and your families are hungry when this depression is still going on, it won't be because I didn't try to help you. Oh, you're sorry. 
They took the seeds, they shook his hand, they thanked him for thinking about their needs and looking out for them and their needs, and they went on home to tell their families that they were going to eat, even if they weren't farmers, they'd learned to be farmers. So Oliver put the mules away, put the wagon away, and started up toward the house, and here came Loy and Leo. By now, they kind of quit the crying and, and the snuffling, but they still were kind of hanging their chin down. Uh, Mr. Geo, we, we sure didn't need to talk to you. Well, good, boys. I, I look forward to talking to you. Well, uh, you see, it's like this. While you were gone to town, we were powerful hungry, and we wanted to buy a watermelon from you. But you weren't here, so we just thought maybe it would be okay if we took it on credit and we came to pay you when you got home. Well, that sounds like a good thing, boys. And uh, how much do you think a watermelon is worth? Well, they each reached in their pocket and they each pulled out a shiny nickel. And I'm standing at, back in the background thinking, He's not going to take those boys' nickels. This is the Depression. A nickel is important. He's not going to take those nickels. That's hard to come by. He put his hand out. He took those nickels. He put the nickels in his pocket. He said, boys, I like doing business with people who are honest. <laughs> and I, I really appreciate you coming and paying the bill like that, even in the same day before the sun went down. I'll always remember that if you need credit, I'll be able to give you credit. And, and by the way, boys, you see that pile of wood over there by Miss Agnes's wash pond? You know, this is Saturday, and of course tomorrow's the Lord's Day, and, and we'll all be, um, we'll be resting tomorrow, but Monday morning, bright and early, she's going to need that wood split and cut up for just the right size for fire to do her washing. And if you think you could get over here before she needs it and get that wood split, I might be able to pay you a nickel apiece for doing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, sir, you can count on us. I thought I could, he said. I felt a lot better because I did not want him to take those boys' nickels. But there was still a surprise, and I had not forgotten. I said, now, Oliver, let's talk about all this mud. And speaking of laundry, I wouldn't know if I'll ever get this outfit you got on the claim. He said, it was the funniest thing. You know, down there at Wolf Creek, at the bottom of that big red clay hill where you even mules sometimes have a hard time getting up that hill. Well, it was Saturday, and it seems like everybody that lives at Holly Fork was showing out in their new cars and their new pickup trucks. And they were all stuck in the mud at the bottom of the hill. And I came along with my mules and said, could I give you guys a hand? Lo and behold, I unhitched my mules, hooked them up to that model board, hauled it to the top. Peg, uh, Peg Day was the first one that I hauled up, and over and over, and slipping and sliding and slopping mud in every direction trying to get up that hill. But at the top, every one of those men turned to me and said, Oliver, I couldn't have gone to town today if you hadn't come to help me. I want to offer you some, uh, a token of my appreciation. And they would give him a little bit of money. And so he told me, he said, by the time I got all those cars and trucks pulled up that hill, I had just exactly what I needed to buy the supplies that we had had on our list. So, and I said, so what's the supplies? He said, go get your, go get your mama's cream pitcher if you will. So I did. And he reached in his pocket.
and he said, I had just enough money to buy the supplies we needed, and I had two quarters left. 